Father in heaven, we thank you again for your word that is sure. In fact, it's the only thing that's sure. We can't trust on anything in this world but on you. And Father, we pray as we study your word today that you give us extra wisdom. We want to uh, come to you the way we are with our offering. That is the blood of Yeshua that cleanses us. Father, we, we come to you asking for your spirit, the gift that you want to give your people. And Father, Yeshua himself has told us that when the spirit of truth comes, he will lead you and guide you into all truth and show you things to come. We claim that promise again today. Be with us. Give us clarity of mind. And Father, I pray that the words of my mouth may be acceptable in your sight. In Yeshua's name we ask these things. Amen. All right, so what have we been looking at here? We've been looking at uh, Daniel and Revelation. Yes, uh, we've also been looking at a concept in Daniel and Revelation. Very simple one. Daniel 12, verse 4. These are the words of Yeshua. Should be in red. Uh, however, in the Old Testament, uh, we don't have red words in there, but if we were going to be consistent, uh, these words would actually be read. Yeshua told Daniel, but thou, O Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Now, I just want you to look at that picture. Um, would you like to put a puzzle together like that? Well, that'd be a little tricky, wouldn't it? Because the picture on the puzzle pieces, is n they are not that clear. And this is exactly what generations that have gone before us have found with the book of Daniel and Revelation. Now, the reason is, very good reason, is the author of these books uh, told us that it would be shut up and sealed even to the time of the end. So... If we were living before the time of the end, then there's no way that we could understand this. We could make attempts. Generations that have gone before us have made attempts trying to figure this out. But if we're going to take his word as it reads, um, he said that it's not going to be understood, even until or until the very time of the end. And Yeshua himself uh, reiterated this in the book of Matthew when he said, when this generation sees all of these things, all of the things in the prophecies, they will know that they're at the end. He says, this generation, the generation that sees all these things, will know they're the end and they're knocking on the doors to eternity. Those are his words, not mine. So we can tell as we're looking in the prophecies and we're actually seeing these things come to pass, we will know that we're at the end. And this is one of the main evidences in my mind that we are at the time of the end because we are seeing, we're unlocking these prophecies. The spirit of truth is being given and it's showing us the things to come. Now, the interesting part of the book of Daniel and book of Revelation is it's all in symbol form. So we've got to know how to interpret the symbols. And of course, we don't need to go anyone to figure it out because within the prophecies it tells us. Things that we've been looking at, we've been looking at animals, beasts, horns, and so on. And these are said to be kingdoms that arise out of the earth amongst many people, languages and tongues, and so on. So the Bible interprets itself in this line. So we don't need to uh, go astray. We just need to let the Bible interpret itself. Uh, no private interpretation. We've got to stay close to what the Bible writers are trying to say the intent of the Spirit when he gave these prophecies. This is what we've been trying to do uh, so hard uh, during, these uh, during these seminars is try to let the Bible interpret itself, and we're going to do the same thing tonight. And uh, we're going to be looking at this going a little deeper into the time of judgment. And this is a very important part of Bible prophecy, and we're going to see why God has a judgment time before he arrives, before Yeshua returns, and every, every person will be either sealed for eternity 
in a kingdom, in the kingdom of God, or sealed uh, in utter darkness. And that's surely uh, not where we want to be. So that's what a lot of people don't understand. This, these uh, decisions are going to be made before Yeshua comes back. And in the prophecies, God has shown us exactly what's going on at the time of judgment. He's shown us the kingdoms that would be on the scene at the time of the judgment. And he showed, showed us the events that are going to be transpiring. Very interesting, and, and I just I can't overemphasize this, is people say, well, prophecy is all God's will. Well, it's true that God has allowed these things to play out, but it, surely it's not God's will that the enemy of souls has his way with men and he's going to persecute God's people. While there is an outcome to this, uh, it's not God's will that anyone suffer. And uh, we're going into a time where people will be suffering. Uh, we're told this, we're warned this, and um, the reason why we're warned this, I fully believe, is because we need to know that we're going to be persecuted because if we started to be persecuted and we weren't warned that we were going to be, then we'd be wondering if we were on the right track. Uh, so persecution is very good for us to know in advance. And the most important thing about the persecution, we know it's going to have an end. There are numbered days in which we will know how long we're going to have to hang on, as it were, to our fingernails uh, holding us up. So let's, uh, let's move on and uh, have a look. Let's get into this. Now, what we've been looking at as we've been studying the word, we've had a launching pad. Does anyone remember what our launching pad was? Anyone? It was the words of Yeshua in Matthew 24, Mark, and Luke. Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21. Now, Yeshua was asked, what is the sign of your coming in the end of the age? And he went through and twice through in the answer to that question. Twice he quotes Daniel verbatim. In other words, he sends us back to Daniel. And he talks about in uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the very first thing that was going to happen is war. This would be the catalyst that would send us over the abyss, as it were, to the time of the end. Now, it goes on to say something afterwards. After war, it goes into famine, and then it goes into pestilence. Then it goes into natural disasters. It talks of earthquakes, but when it talks about earthquakes, that's just one of many ways uh, nature can turn against us. Uh, hurricanes, I'm thinking all kinds of things when it comes to natural disasters. But it's very important that we notice the sequence of events here. And I just, I want to say, because we've had a lot of people uh, writing in and contacting us. I've been on the phone quite a bit this week. Uh, but it's just been wonderful. It's so good to hear people that are studying and just wanting to know the truth. And so we've been having fun answering questions all week. But one of the things that I want to emphasize right here is the sequence. Yeshua said war would be what takes us over that abyss that sends us into that protracted time, that time, times and a half, 12, 90, 13, 35, and so on that we've been talking about. And, and so the important part about that is what follows on the heels of the war. Now, what follows on the heels of the war is famine and pestilence. And I just want to spend just a couple minutes just talking about that because this is critical. Now, I don't know where you live on the earth. But what I do know is most places on the earth are on lockdown. Is everyone aware of that? Is we're not supposed to go out and mix with people unless it's some kind of an emergency. The regulations vary depending on where you are. But have you learned that if it got much worse, you might go hungry? If it got much worse and there was actual disease in the land, if there was famine and disease in the land, what would you do? What would you do next? You see, what's just happened in the last few weeks here, in my mind, is the mercy of God. Because once this war happens, sends us over the abyss, then we have famine. It's 
it's going to be like the the corridors, the shipping corridors are going to be locked down. There won't be to and fro from South America. We get a lot of products from South, South America and so on. And those shipping corridors are going to be locked down. There will be famine and there will be pestilence. Now, if you just look around at some of the places, um, I understand New York. Uh, the morgues are filling up and they don't have any places to put people. It's, it's actually quite a shocking story. And um, by the way, I have had a lot of things come across my desk this week about theories about what's going on. Is this some sort of related to 5G? Is it a plan of the, uh, of the Chinese government? They're trying to spread disease, uh, weapons of warfare, all of these things. There is just a whole host of things. Well, this is what I know for sure. God's word is going to play out. I can't go into the room and talk to those people that are in the know, that are apparently in the know. We don't even know who they are. But God has given us the information we need. We are looking for events that will happen according to God's word. And from my perspective, God is telling us in Matthew, sending us back to Daniel, that war will be what throws us into this last time. We should be using this last uh, few weeks, last month or so, we should be using that to gather all the lessons we can to the place where if we are on lockdown, if we are not allowed to leave our homes, how long would you last? You need to ask yourself the question, how long could you last with what's in your cupboards? How long would you last with the wood that's in your backyard or the coal or so on? How long would you last? Make yourself a list and go through all the things that you would need. And I would say, make a list that you would need things for six months at least. And uh, you need to start work towards that. Of course, we've been telling you uh, that we recommend that if you're in a populated area, you need to really serious, uh, seriously think about getting out of the city, getting to where the population is less dense, getting to the place where you can grow your own food, start thinking about what kind of herbs you could use to build up your immune system. Because as we've been hearing, it's people with weakened immune systems or have already challenges uh, in their system that these diseases, and this is nothing to pick compared to what we are, where we're going. We need to start thinking for the long haul and uh, thinking of where we can go for a place of safety. So when we go from Matthew, Mark, Luke, then we went to Daniel, as Yeshua said, very interesting, John points us now to Revelation. So when we understand Daniel, it actually launches us into the book of Revelation. And I like to just say that's kind of like a second witness to what Daniel said. And we've been looking at the connections between Daniel and Revelation, and they certainly are clear. I tell people, you know, if they've been studying the book of Revelation and they think they have it all figured out, the first thing I ask them, how are you doing with Daniel? Well, if the, I, can, I can guarantee this. This is what I know for sure. If you're studying only the book of Revelation without the book of Daniel, you will never figure it out. You can't do it. You need the book of Daniel to go with it because the symbols in Daniel relate to the symbols in the book of Revelation. And there's additional information in the book of Daniel that is not contained in the book of Revelation. So I really like to encourage you Study the book of Daniel in connection with the book of Revelation. These two books are one, actually. They are layered together. So now we, everyone's familiar with um, the first vision that Daniel had. Whoops, did I say that? Did I say that? Oh, this vision was actually a vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. So Daniel was shown this vision. Nebuchadnezzar was a bit of a proud king, uh, and he, was, uh, he had this dream, and it troubled him. I'm not sure if he actually forgot the dream. It was a big test on his astrologers and wise men. Uh, nevertheless, he had this dream, and he didn't reveal it, and Daniel asked him if he, get, if he would give him some time so him and his three friends went and prayed about this issue. 
And lo and behold, Daniel was given the vision, but it was a vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. And the vision laid out the kingdoms that would come. We're going to look at this in, in a moment. But the very most important thing here is Daniel's name itself means Daniel or Judge Elohim or Elohim is my judge or our judge. So the book of Daniel, his very name means judgment. God is judgment or God judges, Elohim judges. So we can see here the successive kingdoms that came and went. Uh, this whole book is how God will judge kingdoms and kingdoms will come and go. And of course, when we start looking at it, we saw Babylon, Daniel said, Babylon, thou art the head of gold, King Nebuchadnezzar. So he starts us off on this. Then Medo-Persia is the next kingdom that Daniel said would follow him. Greece, Rome, and then Papal Rome, the Holy Roman Empire, or some call it the Unholy Roman Empire. I think that might be more fitting. And then we get down to the ten kings, and the ten kings are at the bottom. And this is what we've been looking at. Now, some of these visions, a lot of times what people have done in the past, remember, this is before the time of the end. People in the past have fitted the rest of the book of Daniel, Daniel's vision, into this first hierarchy of kingdoms. And I believe that is where people make a mistake. While they have been applied to those kingdoms in the past, these next visions, Daniel 7, Daniel 8, Daniel 10 through 12, I believe their primary application or their fulfillment is down in the Tento kingdom. And we've been working on, on that idea through this. And I think we've got some pretty good evidence uh, as to the reason why it is. So when we get to Daniel 7, we see a lion with eagle's wings. We see a bear that's raised up with three ribs in its mouth and it's told to rise and devour much flesh. We see a leopard with four heads and four wings. And then we get to a fourth beast that has ten horns. And we're going to look at this because we want to do a little tiny bit of a review here. It has ten horns, three are uprooted, so it's just left with seven. And then there's an additional kingdom that comes on uh, that's said to be a mouth speaking great things. We see this little horn power in all of these prophecies as we're going to be looking forward. We'll just do a little review on that. So what we've been what we've been teaching here is these kingdoms actually fit down into the Ten Toe Kingdom. And as we look at the numbers, this seems to be how it fits. And here again, the book of Daniel, Elohim is judge or our judge. Daniel was shown a picture of the kingdoms and the events that would transpire under the judgment at the end of this world. And this looks like what Daniel was being shown in not only Daniel chapter 7, we see the judgment. We're going to look briefly at that. Daniel 7, we see the judgment taking place. Daniel 8, we see the Day of Atonement. And we see these events in Daniel 10 through 12 and also in the book of Revelation opens that up even further and gives us the events that are transpiring under the judgment time. So we want to look at the idea here again for those that are kind of new to these concepts. Daniel and Revelation, it's a repeat and enlargement. You don't want to miss this point. All of the prophecies, this is built. These two books are built on a concept that our Father has used in all of the prophecies. You can take prophecies all the way through from the very beginning. A prophet was given a prophecy, then he's given another prophecy, and then another prophecy, and we have to build these prophecies together. You layer them all on top of each other. Isaiah is, is built like this. Jeremiah is built like this. Ezekiel is built like this. They are all built like this. This is a fundamental prin principle of prophecy. God has shown the end from the beginning. So within all of these prophecies, it's very interesting that God gives hope and he shows us the end from the beginning. So as we're going through the hard times in the prophecies, he's given us the end of the story. And of course, that would be when the meek shall inherit the earth. And that's still obviously in front of us. 
So we see here a repeat and enlargement. So let's, let's look at this repeat and enlargement. We can see here the book of Revelation. This is a, I, I got this from a very good friend of mine, a, a prophecy teacher, and he laid this out and I just thought, wow, uh, I need this. So he, he, was, uh, he granted this for me and I was very happy. And I still thank him today every time I look at it. So we can see here that in the prophecies, in the book of Revelation itself, when we read through these prophecies in the book of Revelation, right from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22, we can see six second coming. That's six second coming events. So what does that mean? Well, that means if you were to take those where it's got the second coming and back up to the next second coming. So you, you're with me here. In Revelation chapter 19, you have a second coming. So if you were to back that up to chapter 14, you would see that there's a second coming there. And so you would you would be able to see all the second, sorry, I'm in Revelation 16 at the end of the seven last plagues. So if you go to Revelation 19 to Revelation 16 at the end of the seven plagues, you would see two second comings there at the end of 19, at the end of 16. So that's a layer between those two. So then if you go from 16 to 14, two second coming events, that's another layer between those and so on. And that's what this chart demonstrates. You've got all these layers. So you've got, count them, one, two, three, four, five, six layers that you're going to put on top of each other. Now, very interesting, those are all second comings at the end of each one of those layers. So we should be able to go through the events of each of those chapters and see similarities because if they all end in the second coming, then that would mean that some of the events should overlap that are going through those three chapters, two, three chapters between the layers. I hope you're following what I'm saying here. Can I see a hand here? Is anyone following what I'm saying? Okay, great. So we have these layers. Now through the layers, very interesting, through those layers and the second coming, right before the second coming, you can see judgment. So here again, God has shown in these layers when the judgment happens. He shows the events. He shows the kingdoms that are in the world. Why? Because he does not want the judgment to take you by surprise. He does not want it. That's why these prophecies are such a gift. They not only show God's plan for his people, but they show the enemy's plans for his people. And not only the enemy's plans for his people, the pe people that are under his control, but he shows what those people and his evil angels are going to do to God's people. So we can know in advance, and as it were, brace for this war that's going to be, uh, going to be on us. And so all these prophecies are, are so that we can know ahead of time, and we can, as it were, go through this minefield of the future. These prophecies are a gift of love from our Father that doesn't want to send us over, over the cliff without uh, a rope to hang on to. Yeshua has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us, and he will not, as long as we just keep hanging on to that rope that he's extending to us. So we're, here we have this repeat and enlargement. This same process is in Daniel. Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 9, Daniel chapter 10 through 12. 10 through 12 is all one prophecy. And the summary of the whole book of Daniel, as it were, would be chapter 12. It's got all the time periods. And it really sheds light on all the book of Daniel. Because in Daniel chapter 12, Daniel is told to seal up the book, not just chapter 12. I can't overemphasize that. That's the whole book. And when I say the whole book, I mean the whole book. A lot of people just read the chapters on prophecy. But I emphasize again, the first six chapters of Daniel's life while in captivity in Babylon is exactly the same experience that we're going to go through when Babylon takes us captive again. Is anyone feeling the captivity of Babylon? 
Oh, my, my, my. Yes, we are. It's going to get a lot worse. But the events that Daniel had happened to him, and one of the clearest ones, uh, a couple of the clearest ones, in Daniel chapter 3, when his three friends were asked to bow down and worship an image to the king of Babylon, this is exactly what we see in Revelation 13. We're going to be looking at that again tonight. Uh, Revelation 13, when an image to the beast is made, an image to the beast that is controlled by Babylon. Same thing that we're going to go through. Daniel's also, his freedom to worship was taken away from him. Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 5, we saw the king of Babylon take the golden cups from the temple, represent truth, these golden cups, and he mixes his concoction, the wine of Babylon, in. We see the, exactly the same thing in Revelation chapter 17. We cannot overlook these first few chapters. How about chapter 1? I don't want to overlook this one either. Daniel purposed it in his heart not to defile himself with the king's specialties, the food, the wine, and so on. And he purposed in his heart that he would not do this. And lo and behold, he had dreams, he had understandings. And this is the gift that God gave him because of purpose in his heart. We are told that in the time of the end, men would see visions, dream dreams, young men, young uh, women, old men would have dreams and they would prophesy. If, if God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, we can expect that he will pour out his spirit on all flesh, just as he says, and we will have those dreams and visions. We don't know who those are uh, at this time. Some of you may, may be that person. I don't know. But we know that if we are faithful and we do what we should do, that he is going to reproduce these gifts into us. And greater things, we're told, we will do than even Yeshua himself. Repeat and enlargement in the time of judgment. So here again, we're just going to look at these chapters. In Daniel 2, with the ten toes, time of judgment again. This is when the rock is cut out and it lands on the toes. So these are these kingdoms at the end of time after Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome had passed from the scene. And we're down to just that last one world order will be destroyed that at the time of judgment, which is what we're going to be looking at here again today, going a little deeper in there. And then Daniel chapter 7, we're told in Daniel chapter 7, verse 10 and 11, is the time of judgment when these kingdoms, we can know when these kingdoms arrive on the scene, judgment is coming soon, and we can see how soon by understanding these prophecies. Daniel 8, we see the Day of Atonement. Uh, and we see the kingdoms that are uh, around in the world again at the Day of Atonement, which follows the beginning of judgment, which we see in Daniel 7. So we see here again is that these festivals are all through the prophecies. And this is, of course, what people have not applied in the past. We need to bring, we need to resurrect those festivals this, in this time of the end. Like Malachi says, remember the law of Moses, my servant, with the statutes and the judgments. And this, these statutes are part of what God is trying to resurrect here at the end. I believe not only for our own benefit as we celebrate these festivals, as we get to know our brothers and sisters better by spending more time in these events, but we get to know our Heavenly Father and we get, get to understand His plan much better when we start to experience these festivals um, and um, it's a time of learning and understanding. And this is what I'm looking for is Passover is next week, right? Some people are celebrating Passover uh, already. Some already have. Uh, some are going to do it uh, very soon. We're, gonna, we're planning on it next month. I don't get so concerned about when. I'm just encouraging people to study. I believe our Father is going to straighten the calendar out. Um, so we just need to keep pushing forward. Uh, in truth, and he's going to bring us together. Revelation 5 through 7, here again, we see the judgment. This is the time of the four horsemen. We're going to briefly look at this again tonight. The four horsemen is the opening vision in the book of Revelation, and we've been looking at the possibility. The opening vision in the Revelation is Daniel's opening vision 
Daniel chapter 7. Remember, Daniel chapter 2 was not uh, Daniel's vision. It was Nebuchadnezzar's vision. And the reason why he had the vision is because he wanted his kingdom to last forever. So he had a special dream that showed him, sorry, Nebuchadnezzar, after you is going to come another one and another one and another one. So this was for his benefit, but it can be for ours too, because as those kingdoms have come and go, it shows us again that our Father is all-knowing and he knows what's coming. But he's shown us in the ten toes, in the feet will be the last effort for a one world order. And that's exactly where we are. We know we're going there rather quickly. All the events of the last few weeks have actually sped that up a lot. Uh, we could talk about that all day, but, we're, uh, but everyone, I'm sure, everyone that's watching is aware that there's things that have transpired in government levels that are going to make it very much easier uh, to keep people locked down, uh, to keep gatherings uh, from being too large. All of these kinds of things have been put in place the last little while amongst many other things. Uh, if you want to talk about vaccines, that's a whole nother subject. Uh, that's a can of worms we don't want to open up right now. But even that um, is a very important thing that's just going on right now. Daniel chapter 7, Revelation 5 through 7, I believe, are exactly the same things. We have four beasts and four horses. We're going to look at that briefly again tonight, just in case you haven't thought of that idea. Uh, we see judgment in Daniel chapter 7. We see judgment, Revelation 5 through 7. Both chapters are events that will transpire in the time of the end, the time in which we're living. Daniel chapter 8 also is a parallel to that too. We see four horns. We're told four kingdoms rise out of that. And same thing again, the kingdoms of five through seven, the four horsemen. These are kingdoms. Very clear that these are kingdoms as well. And what God is trying to show us, he's trying to show us the kingdoms that will be on the world scene so that we can know where we are in time. And so that the judgment will not take us unawares. And we can know, as Yeshua said, know that the end is near, even at the doors. Revelation chapter 12, we're introduced to a fiery red dragon. It's the instrument that Satan works through just the same way as he worked through uh, the serpent in the garden. He works through this, uh, er these earthly powers, as we're going to see here. Uh, it is his main instrument, his tool that he uses. It's a set of earthly governments that have formed an alliance together uh, known as the European Union. We've been looking at that. That's that great red dragon, the kingdoms that are represented there, the European Union. And that is the seat of the beast and also the seat of the papacy. We've been looking at that. That should be no surprise to anyone. Um, this is where a power that is small, tells us, doesn't have an army other than the Swiss Guard. Uh, not really an army that's going to protect a country. Um, but that's an army. We've been looking at the clues that would tell us this little horn power, the identity of that. Uh, the papacy itself, uh, change times and laws, and so on. We could, uh, we've talked extensively about that. Also, Revelation 15 through 16, or sorry, Revelation 13 and 14, this is when the mark of the beast is implemented, um, and all the kingdoms that are involved in implementing them. We're going to kind of review a little bit of that, too. And uh, also in verse 15, or chapter 15 in Revelation 16, this is the judgment that is poured out on the wicked. The uh, God's people are protected from this. This is what I call where uh, Psalms 91 comes alive. A thousand will fall at the right side and 10,000 at your left and so on. This is what uh, is going to be happening through that time. Psalms, actually 91, was pointing forward to this time that's in front of us. Revelation 17 through 19 are the events, the judgment that's poured out on the harlot. This is the one that controls. Uh, this is the mother of harlots. We've been looking at the identity of that. I believe the mother of harlots is obviously a woman, but it's a woman, a pure woman gone rogue. 
uh, turns itself into a harlot. And we can see that's exactly what Rome, the category Rome would fit into. At the time of the disciples, uh, Peter and, uh, and Paul, when they went to Rome, they set up a church. They had a faithful church in Rome. Uh, however, over the years, uh, the papacy gained control. Uh, they slowly went into darkness, and when the papacy uh, went uh, and took control, it went completely uh, the wrong way, and uh, that's commonly known as the Dark Ages, and I couldn't uh, have a more fitting term than the time when Rome ruled. That's Papal Rome, when they ruled. So this is that harlot now. She's become a harlot, once faithful, then became a harlot. We see this same picture back in uh, the Old Testament in Ezekiel when God calls his, uh, uh, his church a delicate woman who has become a harlot. So we see the same symbolism. This is what I say. We don't need to interpret this uh, privately. The Bible helps us in this. So at the time of the end, we see a church that was pure, the Church of Rome, that has gone rogue, and now it's warring against the remnant of her seed and she's called the mother of harlots that means she has many other daughters and of course those would be the fallen churches any church and i've said this and i can't overemphasize this as well any church that follows the customs of rome what do i mean when the customs of rome we've seen that this church changes times and laws and we've we've studied that that's the festival times and laws. Those are God's appointed times and laws. Why did this church do this? This church did it under the influence, uh, under the inspiration of the Antichrist. Satan himself inspired them to do this and change these things. Why? Number one, the festivals are dates. I call them dates with our father and his son. If we miss those dates, if we miss those appointed times, we're not going to get an intimate relationship with our Father. Yeshua himself said, this is life eternal, that you know the only true God and Yeshua whom he has sent. These festivals are for us to take time from our busy schedule and take time and spend it with him. But not only him, they're called holy convocations. That's gatherings. The Sabbath is a gathering. These festivals are yearly gatherings, Sabbath being weekly, and yearly gatherings in these annual festivals. These are for the building us up of the body of Yeshua, and it's a time for learning and so on. It's a time for encouraging each other. So if you were the devil, and you wanted to get rid of all of our Father's people, you would change the times, and you would change his laws, because we're told in the book of James, that we will be judged by the law of liberty. And that's exactly what God's laws are. They give us liberty. Uh, we don't have our conscience breathing down on us saying guilty, guilty, guilty. Uh, we want to be free from all of that. And we, when we stay within God's, our Father's guidelines, his Ten Commandments, his statutes, and so on, we are free, actually. Uh, that's when true happiness is attained. So the enemy of souls does not want us to have that. He's created a system that uh, pushes other, other laws, other uh, festivals, other times. And we know what those are. We went through those. Sunday is a great example. And uh, Easter, the whole Easter week, the seven-day festival that the Catholic Church promotes. And also the uh, Christmas festival, an eight-day festival, again, which the Catholic Church promotes. You may not keep all eight days, but the Mother Church has a perfect counterfeit uh, of these festivals. And um, she's going to the where these things will be law. They will be law. And of course, it's to turn us away from God's ways. So let's, um, let's look at this. We have seen Pentecost in Revelation chapter 8, verse 5, and there's other places as well, but this is the most obvious, so we're just looking at the most obvious, Pentecost, uh, Pentecost in Revelation 8, verse 5. It tells us that there was a censer on the golden altar that was cast to the earth. That's the fire of our Father cast to the earth. Well, that fire is given to his saints. 
And uh, that fire is the same fire that was brought down from heaven at the day of Pentecost. We can expect that the fire, the censer, will be thrown down again at Pentecost, and it will light on those who are faithful, those that are praying, those that are praying for the Spirit, and uh, we want to be in that group of people. So we've seen that. We've seen the Feast of Trumpet, Trumpets in Daniel chapter 7, 9 through 10. I saw thrones put into place. The Ancient of Days was seated. The books was were open. The court was set. We've seen all of that already. We're not going to look at that again today. Uh, Day of Atonement, we saw that in Daniel 8, 14. Revelation 15, verse 5. Revelation uh, 15 verse 5 tells us that the tabernacle of the testimony was open in heaven. That only happens on the Day of Atonement. Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 tells us that the sanctuary is cleansed at a certain time, the 2300 evenings and mornings. We looked at that extensively as well. So these are two clear uh, places where we can see the Day of Atonement. So we've got these uh, before us in the prophecies. We've been putting them into our timetable as we go, the Feast of Tabernacles, this fleeing into the wilderness. The, the Jews, when they did this, they remembered the time in the wilderness when God preserved them in the wilderness. We have our wilderness journey coming. Uh, we have that coming. And, and you know, if we're practicing this, if we go out at the Feast of Tabernacles and build a little tent and live there, and figure out how to do this, we might be in better shape when it comes to the Feast of the Tabernacles when we have to flee into the wilderness for our lives. Uh, somehow I think there's a lesson. Uh, some people call them rehearsals. It might be a good idea because we know we're going to flee. Yeshua told us that. He said, pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Uh, in other words, we are going to take a flight at some point and practicing the Feast of the Tabernacles will be good. We also see the Feast of the Tabernacles at the end of the millennium, the absolute fulfillment, the completion of the plan of the Feast of the Tabernacles is after the millennium. And there is no question why the last day of that feast is called the last great day. That's because it's the last great day of the plan of salvation. Once we get to that day, it's eternity. Everything with the plan of salvation is now behind us. And we have all our eternity to look forward to after that. The plan of God will be complete. And we see this in Revelation chapter 21. It's very, very clear. And we're going to look at that. We're not going to get to that today, uh, but we are going to look at that um, and uh, we're planning on keeping going uh, also. So the next time we meet, um, which will be next Sabbath again, we're going to be on next Thursday, I believe. Isn't that right? Next Thursday, we're going to be on. That'll be the first day of Unleavened Bread. That's what we're keeping here. And then we'll have a meeting after that every uh, 3.30 in the afternoon here Central Time. So wherever you are on, uh, on the planet, you have a look and figure out what time that is for you. And we're planning on meeting every day uh, through the feast at that time. And we will be covering that final fulfillment of the Feast of the Tabernacles. Very interesting. A lot of people are thinking that that's going to be completely fulfilled at the second coming. But uh, it's not so. Um, it will not be completely fulfilled. It's not until after the millennium that there's one more that gets fulfilled, and that's the Jubilee. What happened on the Jubilee? Can anyone, you know, I can't get feedback here, but does anyone know what happened on the Jubilee? The land was given back to its original owners. This is when the words of Yeshua will actually be fulfilled to their fullest meaning, is inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation all the way back to the beginning. It's going to be remade at the end of the millennium. This is where the meek, those that have decided to be in the kingdom of heaven, those people will inherit the earth. And this is when the fulfillment uh, of Yeshua's words, thy will be done in heaven as it is. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Sorry about that. That's, uh, those are the words of Yeshua. 
So we are still looking forward to that because that has not been fulfilled. And that won't even be fulfilled when Yeshua comes back. His will will not be fulfilled on earth. And we're going to be looking at more into that as we go. So the Passover, the next one I have is the Passover. Revelation 19.7 uh, talks about the marriage supper of the Lamb when Yeshua celebrated the Passover meal with his disciples. He says, I've desired to eat this Passover uh, with you before I suffer. I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So this Passover that we're looking at is the bride in Revelation chapter 19, 7. It says the bride has made herself ready. So we're looking forward to that feast in the kingdom of heaven where we will celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb and all the guests will be there, that number that no man can number. This is a time that we do not want to miss. Uh, and I don't believe that's too far in front of us. We're looking at that uh, within our lifetime for sure. Uh, that's what we're going to see here. Luke 22, 15 through 17, the verse when he said, I will no longer eat of this until it's fulfilled in the kingdom. So he is waiting for us before he takes part in this feast again. Feast of Unleavened Bread, we've talked about that. That's when the fulfillment will be not only the sin that we're asked to take out of our lives now, but even the presence of sin. When we enter the kingdom of heaven the, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, there will be no presence of sin of any kind. It's in a kingdom that where righteousness dwells. There will be nothing that offends in that kingdom. So the fulfillment of that when we reach the kingdom of heaven. And um, that is when we will celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb. First fruits, of course, Daniel 12 verse 1 says, When Michael stands up, there will be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. At that time, your people will be delivered. Everyone found written in the book, and the dead in Yeshua will raise. First, the same thing as First Thessalonians uh, 4, 16 and 17. That's the resurrection of the dead. We're told in also in, in First Corinthians, Paul tells us again that Yeshua was a type, and he was the first fruits. He was called the first fruits. He is a type of those that will be raised in the first resurrection. So we can see here. We can see the timing because the festivals are all types, not only in kind, but in time. And we've been looking at that concept. It's just a concept with the sanctuary. Once we figure out where we are in the sanctuary, what type we are, we can know what time uh, we're going to arrive uh, as well. And the first fruits, Daniel 12, verse 1, Revelation 20, 4 and 5, talks about the first resurrection. It says, those that are raised in the first resurrection, they will reign with Yeshua for a thousand years. So that's another thing that we're going to be looking at as well through the feast. We're going to be exploring that thousand year period and uh, try to come to grips with exactly what's going to be going on during that thousand year period. I know there's a lot of ideas out there, but we need some substance. We need some good cornerstones some anchors that we can hold on to so that we can know for sure uh, because we need to know where we're going for that thousand years. Second Passover, uh, Matthew 24, 37, as in the days of Noah. We've talked briefly about this. We're going to get to that tonight. Is it possible at the time that Noah actually got onto the ark, we've talked briefly about this in the past, he got on the ark at the second Passover. It was on the 10th day of the second month. There's reasons why he didn't get on in the first month. Uh, it would seem that he had to take care of his, his grandfather, Methuselah, had to bury him. That would disqualify him. And he was certainly getting ready to be on a, a long trip, a long journey. And on two counts, he qualified to keep the Passover in the second month. He was sealed into the ark on the 10th day of the second month, which is very interesting because all the, the ordinances that were in the first Passover were to be kept in the second month. Well, the 10th day of the first month, they were supposed to choose a lamb. Very interesting. Well, 
Noah didn't do that, so he did that in the second month. On the day that he would have chose his lamb, he went up into the ark and he was sealed into the ark. Don't miss this. The timing is perfect. So he was sealed into the ark on the 10th day of the second month. Would have been the time that he chose his lamb, his Passover lamb. Friends, these feasts are so vitally important to understand. They teach us many, many things. What is the sign? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. First sign, deception. Deception, we're going to create a little bit of a timeline here. Uh, and we're going to look at this just briefly. The last year of this Earth's history, everyone wants to know just what's going to happen. This is the last festival cycle that is going to be happening during this time period. We're going to open this up a little bit more. We're going to see this enters war uh, is the very first thing. This is according to Yeshua. He points us back to Daniel, Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 10. Daniel stood on the banks of two great rivers, two great rivers in the Middle East, and he saw the events that would soon, I believe, come to pass. This was a war with the West and the kings of Media and Persia. When we look out in the world, we can see who that is. Very clear. We're just going to briefly recap that in a few minutes. After the war, we talked about famines. This is going to be the extent. These are events that happen because it's a cause to effect. So the war is going to be of such a magnitude that famine will follow. I'm talking about shipping lanes being cut off. You think what's just happened in the last few weeks is, is incredible? What's going to happen during this war when everyone's cut off of supplies? We're talking cut off of oil. We're talking cut off of gasoline. We're talking cut off of food and so on. There will be famines. All the, the greenhouses that are producing food in this country, they will shut down. There will be power outages and so on. This is why we're saying get out and get yourself a place. Get yourself a place maybe with some other people if you can't afford it. Help them to establish a place where people will be safe to come and be able to ride out this storm. Just as Noah was told to build a boat, to build an ark for the saving of his household, we too have been warned of what's coming. We are going to get a storm such as there never has been since there was a nation. So we have been warned of this. Noah was not only told to build an ark, he was told to put all the food into the ark so that he could ride this storm out. And this is the same thing that God is trying to share with us as he's given us knowledge in these prophecies. It's not to scare us, it's to prompt us into motion. It's to put our shoes on, to get our boots on, to plant some ground, to cultivate the soil, so that we can live through this time. And I, I mentioned last week, and I just, it, it's so amazing to me that before the end, our Father is going to get us back to where he started us, in the garden. Because somehow when we're, we're, when we're in the garden, we're relying more totally on him for rain, for all these things that we need to grow, for sunshine and so on. He's going to get us totally dependent on him. How's he going to do that? He's going to get us out of Babylon and get us into the country where we can hear his voice in nature and we can uh, have some of that quiet time. This is going to reconnect us with our creator. This is a blessing. This is so we can ride out the storm so that we won't have famine. I rather believe that people that have gone into the country in this time that can grow their own food, they will live like kings and queens through this time. No question about it. What's going to follow that is pestilence. Here again, this is a cause and effect. So the war has caused famines. The famines have caused pestilence, and that's on the heels of war as well. If we think what we've just seen in pestilence is bad, that is nothing. That is absolutely nothing to what's coming. We want to build up our immune system, get away from high-density populations, get to the place where you do not have to go into town if that's not a safe place to go. Also, the next thing that comes along is persecution. 
It's the idea, as we've been looking at, is we need to get back to God. All of these disasters, we need to get back to God. Well, guess who arrives at the, on the scene at this time? This is the little horn. This is the harlot. This is the mouth speaking great things. This is uh, no other power than Rome itself that will bring an apparent peace to the world, will bring people to work together. And we can see that Rome is is really laying the groundwork for now. It's amazing how world leaders, it's, you know, you hear they're going to, from here to maybe Moscow to meet with Putin. Well, there's usually a stop in Rome, and I just can't help but think they're going to visit someone else in Rome. It's just, you, you just watch the map, and Rome is a, uh, a cross point. It's a landing point for many of the, of the leaders of this world, and they are stopping to talk to the Pope himself. And we can, we know this is coming because prophecy has foretold it. Well, we know there's going to be an end, of course. And we know before that time, just before the end, is when the abomination of desolation, we're going to look at that. We just kind of opened that up last week. We're going to be looking at that a little closer to see who that is. My personal opinion, that is the abomination of desolation, not an abomination of desolation or not an application of an abomination of desolation. When I say that, I'm, I'm thinking of an example of Atticus Epiphanes was some Bible um, expositors believe that he was the abomination of desolation. But you sh that was about 200 years before Yeshua warned us that when we see the abomination of desolation, so he certainly cannot be a fulfillment of the abomination. He could be a type or uh, represent this, but by no means can he be. Could the papacy also be an abomination of desolation? Well, we know what it does. It changes times and laws, but it does this under the inspiration of the abomination of desolation. So all of these forerunners are examples of what Satan's been up to all the time. We can expect Satan in the flesh, if you will, to visit us and make himself known to us. After all, after all, isn't he the one that's seeking worship? We see this played out in Yeshua's own life. He said that if you will just bow down and worship me, Yeshua would not do that. He said, the Father only, Yahweh only, will, thou, will I worship. And this is the challenge that the followers of Yeshua are going to have. Yeshua overcame at that time of temptation. And we too must overcome in the time of the end. We will be challenged the same way. And Yeshua himself, we may face him uh, one day. Time of trouble, this is at the time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation. When, you, when Satan himself shows up impersonating Yeshua himself, calling for people to worship him, this will be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation. This is the ultimate time of trouble, Jacob's trouble, if you will. The night of wrestling for deliverance. And at this, it'll be right after that, It'll be at the time of the end. The abomination of desolation, we're told that from the time the daily is taken away and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1,290. We saw in this, and we're going to look at this again, just so we can rehearse it a bit, 1,290 days will pass from the time the daily is taken away. This is the time Yeshua will take the throne, as it were, sit in a temple of God, declaring himself that he is God, showing himself that he is God. This is what Paul spoke about in 2 Thessalonians. We're going to look at that, look at those verses, and we're going to see here clearly that uh, the abomination of desolation is going to show up in person. And this is the time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation. Fortunately for us, there are only 45 more days that we will have to hang on to because we're told how long it is, and that's just a blessing. During this time, during this time that we've just overlapped here, this could be a possible, and people say, well, how long? 
I believe that this is going to be somewhere close to about a seven year period. There's some things that have to happen. Number one, there's a war. Then we have to have famine, pestilence, and earthquakes. But also during this time, there has to be a temple. There has to be a worship styled temple built in Jerusalem and the Jews will have this temple erected. How long that's going to take? Uh, it's very possible it might just take 70 weeks. Who would guess? But it might take something like that. Um, they may be trying to fulfill this prophecy that was given. We've looked briefly at that too. Daniel chapter 11 verse, I believe, 14 seems to indicate that there will, the Jewish people will try to fulfill a vision of the past about rebuilding the temple. We're going to see this. So this is going to take some time. Then the persecution, uh, the daily will be taken away, the temple system, the sacrificial system that uh, the people of Israel, the Jewish people will have set up. This will be stopped. The little horn will take control. This is the time that the daily is taken away and so on. So from that point in time till 1290, it's 1290 days until that time. So this is how we can... We can see what's going on. We know the world events. We know the kingdoms that are involved. So this is how we can know that we have arrived. I want to take a minute. It speaks, this is in the two or six of the temple at the time of the abomination. Do you oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, someone brought it to my attention. I misspoke. I do that when I start to ramble sometimes. So you got to check me up. And, and by the way, if I say something that's completely off the wall, do write in and let me know. I'd like a shot at trying to correct it. Um, apparently, I said something like that Yeshua is going to sit in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Uh, no, Yeshua doesn't have to do that. He is in the throne room of heaven right now, sitting next to his father. No, we're talking about an imposter Yeshua, an imposter Jesus, a counterfeit Jesus, declaring himself to be God, sitting in the throne. It will be a counterfeit second coming. So, in order for it to be a counterfeit second coming, it's got to be something that you're looking for. If you accepted a counterfeit $20 bill, it would be something that you were looking for. You had your hand out to take it. So the world will be brought to a place where they will absolutely require someone to rescue them. And uh, Satan has set all of this disaster up so that he will just come right on time, right at the time when everyone's expecting him to come, and they will accept him uh, as he is in all of his glory. So now we go back to Daniel 8. We want to just do a little review on Daniel 8, this war that we just spoke about that's going to start us over the abyss into the time of the end. Suddenly a male goat came from the west across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. Key here. Any application, and I know of applications that have made in the past, any application that falls short of this, this prophecy three times Daniel was told that this is at the time of the end. Daniel, Daniel 8 verse 17 says, Daniel, this vision's at the end. Verse 19, same vision, Daniel 8 verse 19 said, Daniel, I'm making known to you what will happen in the latter time of the indignation. For at the point of time, the end shall be. And it began in, in verse 26, Daniel, seal this up. It's secret. It's for many days in the future. Three times in this, we're told it's at the time of the end. I don't know what we don't get about that, but it says the vision is at the time of the end. Suddenly, a male goat came across from the west across the surface of what? Does it say the Mediterranean? Does it say half of the Mediterranean? No, it doesn't. It says the whole earth. Let's just take it for what it says. We've been looking at that. Once we start examining these prophecies and taking them for exactly what they say, we can see that they don't, in some cases, say what we think they say or say what they, that we've been told that they say. We need to, as it were in Revelation chapter 10, you eat this, but then it becomes bitter and the command goes out to prophesy again. The idea that it's possible that those that have gone before us haven't quite got it right. 
So we may find ourselves sort of having to rehash some of this stuff, looking at it again, having a look at what exactly it says, applying it to the time setting that it says within the prophecy itself. This prophecy is talking about a ram, a battle between a ram that is in the eastern, I've got it circled there, I ran, I don't, I'm not sure if you can see that in the center there, I've got this little oval, I ran, that's the center stage. Has anyone heard anything about Iran in the news lately? Yes, the kings of Media and Persia will be center stage. This is when Islam will make its grand stage on the, in Earth's history, and they will go, bro go for their broke, for their idea of the New World Order, which has Allah ruling, which has Sharia law everywhere on the planet. This is their end game. The Christian end game is that Yeshua will reign. And everyone that I'm talking to here is familiar with that. If you come out of Islam, you will be familiar with what I'm, what I'm saying. They both have these ideas that they will ultimately, their savior will ultimately rule. Well, both of their ideologies are coming and they're about to meet. We see Islam on the rise. We see Christianity on the rise as well. And uh, they are trying to convert the world to Christianity. We're going to see this. We have seen this in the prophecies where the winner in this war will be the West. They will come from the West and take on the ram and they will defeat the ram and break both its horns, it tells us. And um, this will be the end of that. And I saw him confronting the ram. He was moved with rage against the ram, broke his two horns. These are the kings of Media and Persia. These are the ones that really dictate to Islam. This would be Saudi Arabia, um, all through the Middle East, Asia, uh, Middle East, Asia, right from Afghanistan, Pakistan, all the way through to Libya. The whole of North Africa is predominantly Muslim as well, Indonesia and, uh, and Malaysia. Very huge Muslim population. And so they are going to make their move soon. Uh, I just saw something in the news the other day that it was that some are getting worried because the United States is in a, a bit of a tough spot right now. Uh, and some are worried that maybe Islam will make a move here. Uh, I certainly hope not. But friends, we are getting close to this uh, and we want to be aware of what's going on. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but he cast him down to the ground, trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from its hand. Now, Islam has other people, other nations that are friendly to it because they have the same enemy. They have the same Western enemy in the United States. I'm talking about uh, countries like possibly Venezuela, uh, North Korea, and so on. Some of these countries may help out and do what they can do, but it tells us in the prophecy this power from the West that has this notable horn, which we're saying is the United States, that it is broken. And after this war, it tells us, it says the he goat, which is the UN, represents the UN, that has these notable horns on it. The he goat mal magnified it, uh, himself exceedingly. And when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead of up, there came up four notable horns toward the four winds of heaven. And here we go again. We, there's no... Uh, guessing at what this is within the Daniel 8 itself, it tells us that the, uh, these are kingdoms or kings. So we know this is representing kings of the earth. No private interpretation. We can know that this is what this represents. So when we look out in the world today, do you think God is telling us of the minor kingdoms of the earth or the greatest kingdoms of the earth? Well, it's pretty obvious uh, what that would be. He's showing us the dominant kingdoms and the greatest king in the notable horn today would obviously be the United States of America. And it just so happens we have that notable horn. We have four horns that come up and take its place. And we can see that exactly the way the United Nations is structured. This is a product of a long time of working. We saw this before. Um, and after the First World War, 
it sort of grew out of the League of Nations, but there was a uh, movement afoot to draw the nations together. This has been going on for a long, long time, culminated in the UN. Well, guess what? The United Nations, founding fathers, if you will, the United States, Great Britain, Russia, China, and France, which France is a, a kingdom of the European Union, these are the countries that dominate the UN. These are called the permanent members of the UN. These members can veto anything. Russia has used its veto more than any other nation. So everything that happens in the world, um, they, can, uh, they can defeat it. They have last say. They are not voted on to the committee or off the committee. The Security Council has people voted in and out, but these are the permanent members of the security. So these five nations basically run the world. The Muslim nations are getting tired of this. Countries like Germany are, is, is not happy with this. And, and Japan and other nations are not happy with this because they have grown in power themselves and they want more say. They do not believe that these five nations should be basically ruling the world. And fair enough, fair enough. But this is the way the nations are run. It's a matter of fact. And it's also a matter of fact that in the time of the end, God has revealed through beast powers these same kingdoms. Even the number of these kingdoms is the same. When the United States falls from its high position, there will only be four left, just as the prophecies say, just as Daniel 10 through 12 say, that this mighty king will be broken and four will come up in its position. Now we're looking at Daniel 7. That's where we are first introduced to these kingdoms. This is what I believe to be those ten toes. This is the last effort for a one world order. We see the one world order, the kingdoms come up, and now they're jostling for position. This is exactly where we see them now. We've talked about the lion with eagle's wings being the United States and Great Britain. Great Britain, we've been saying for years, has to come out of the EU. We've seen this now. They are now working much more closely with the United States. Uh, how fitting a lion with eagle's wings. It's the eagle's wings that will hold England up at least for a time uh, before it falls, before these eagle's wings are ripped off. Then it's said that the lion has to stand on its own two feet uh, like a man. So we saw this in this prophecy. We saw Dan in Daniel chapter 7, we saw a little horn that is a mouth speaking great things. And we've been looking at who that is with all of our proofs. Uh, no hiding it any longer. This has to be the papacy. It is the power that's trying to bring the world together in peace, in harmony, trying to level the playing field, as it were. Uh, first and foremost in global warming, uh, just in case you weren't aware, the Pope is leading the charge on that as well. He says we've got to take, uh, take uh, good care of this planet that our Father has given to us. So here we say that this equals something. Okay, so let's just imagine this equal sign in the middle. We're going to look at four visions here, uh, and we're going to look at these visions. They're all the same. These are the layers in the vision. So we see four beasts here, and then we see eagle's wings that are plucked off. So we only have four remaining after the eagle's wings are plucked off. We see here that these are representatives of the countries that make up the dominant force in the world. These are the countries that are the five um, leading members on the Security Council, the permanent members that they're called. And when we put these on a world stage, we can see who they are. The eagle is the United States of America. We can see that the lion is Great Britain. We can see that this, this uh, four-headed uh, e four leopard are the, is the Asian bloc. And we can see here that the bear would be the Russian bloc. And the fourth beast that comes on the stage has ten horns. Three are uprooted. And it's said to have a little horn 
that is the one that speaks great things. It's when this little horn comes on stage that we've been looking at is that's when judgment comes. That's when the a cup of iniquity is filled up and judgment begins. And we're going to be looking at that again tonight. That is at the time when the mark of the beast is implemented. All right, so that's the little horn in Daniel chapter 7. We see the same thing in Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8, as we just looked at briefly, there's a war. There's a notable horn on, on the goat with four other horns. This, I'm showing you a picture here when the notable horn has been broken off. There's only four now remaining. And we're told on this goat that there's also a little horn that grows exceedingly great. This parallels Daniel chapter 7. So here again, we see a layer. A layer is put on here. We see more information. We see judgment begin in Daniel chapter 7 in verses 9 and 10. We see the judgment cleansed or the, the sanctuary cleansed in Daniel chapter 8. Now we're talking about the heavenly sanctuary. This is where all of these feasts point to. It's the heavenly Jerusalem, the city of the great king, where this Jerusalem was only a type of the heavenly Jerusalem. We see this when the heavenly Jerusalem comes down. So this will take the place there. So we can see that the earthly Jerusalem, don't lose sight of this, the earthly Jerusalem over there, Paul tells us in Hebrew, we're done with that city. We're not interested in that city. We're not looking for that city. In fact, those that uh, to offer sacrifices at the temple when it was still happening in Jerusalem, when he wrote that in Hebrews, he said those people are not even worthy to eat at the table. Which table do we eat at? We eat at the Lord's table, Yeshua's table. And that is we enter into the heavenly sanctuary by faith. This is also told uh, in the book of Hebrews. We come in boldness to the throne of grace. This is the table that we eat at. Those that serve a sanctuary on earth are not worthy uh, because of the rejection to eat at Yeshua's table. Friends, we don't want to miss these types. We don't want to misunderstand these types. I know there's a lot of idea out there that maybe we want to pack our bags and as soon as they start sacrificing over there in the temple, do not get mixed up in that, please. Uh, that's not what we want to do. Uh, we're going to do some more presentations on that because there seems to be much confusion on this issue now. This temple is leading us away. This temple on earth will lead us away from truth, not bring us into connection with it. So here we see here in Daniel chapter 8 that there is a large horn that grows up. Very interesting. The little horn in Daniel 8, what does it do? It makes war against the saints. Little horn in Daniel chapter 8, it does the same thing. It persecutes the saints. Same thing. Well, we see the opening in vision in Revelation. We see four again. The number is not a coincidence. We see four horses. Here again, we have four beasts in Daniel chapter 7. We have four horns that represent the same four kingdoms. Revelation, we change again. Now we have four horses, but they're the same as the four horns, same as the four beasts. And we can see this clearly. The first beast, it says, goes out to conquer and to conquering. The lion and the eagle's wings, the United States, if you will, is the good guy. It's portrayed as the good guy going out into the world to create democracies, set up a system after its order the strongest nation, it goes out to conquer and to conquer, to set up kingdoms like itself, the head of the UN, that type of thing. And then the next kingdom that goes out, it says a fiery red horse. What does it say? It takes peace from the earth. That's the same thing as the bear. It says arise and devour much flesh. Not a better fitting symbol as a red horse as to be communist Russia. A lot of people think that Russia is not a communist country. I think you need to rethink that. Um, you need to really rethink that with the politics that have been going on in that country just, just recently. 
is demonstrating without a question uh, it is not a democratic country. And then we can see the fourth horse that has a set of scales. And uh, it's, it's got to do with famine. I'll tell you what, when the United States goes down, Russia will rise to dominance. It will rise and devour much flesh. It will take peace from the earth. This is what it says. And it will take back all its loss without the United States to stand its ground and to stop the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union will do what it's called to do, take peace from the earth. Also, the third horse, the dark horse with the scales, this represents China. China will starve. It will be famine in the land. When there's no more economy, when the United States is not ready to purchase their goods, if the rest of the world goes down, so to speak, if the economy in the world goes down, China will starve. The amount of people there, it's going to be tough. Very, very tough in China. And the fourth horse is none other than the fourth beast. And it's very interesting. The one that rides the fourth beast is none other than death. That's the name of the rider. Very, very interesting. We see in Daniel chapter 7, judgment come on the scene in earth's history. We see Daniel chapter 8, judgment come on the scene at the time of the four horns. And the same as the time of the four beasts. We see this same thing, but the time the fourth horseman rides along, he's that fourth beast. When you see the fourth horseman, guess what? Persecution of God's people. It tells us that as soon as he comes on the stage, he is called death and he destroys with famines and it even says with the beasts of the earth very interesting it says that he's given dominion over a fourth of the earth sounds a little like a kingdom to me this matches up we're, we're not trying to change anything we're just connecting this to the fourth so if the fourth horseman if what I'm suggesting here, if the fourth horseman is a kingdom, if it's given dominion over a quarter of the earth, I would rather suspect that those other three will each have a quarter of themselves and they will have dominion over the whole world, these four kingdoms. The world will be divided into four major blocks. That would be the, uh, the Anglo-American, Anglo-Saxon block. That will also be the... The second block would be the Russian block, and that will take in some of those other nations, could possibly even be Ukraine and some of these other nations uh, and so on. Also, the European Union would be the fourth beast and China being the third beast. So we can see here clearly that judgment also happens. It follows the persecution, which is exactly what Daniel 7 says exactly what Daniel 8 says. So we can see that this is just a repeat and enlargement. Goes on in, in at the Four Horsemen, talks about the kings of the earth now, towards the end of that, after it's talking about these Four Horsemen, the kings of the earth and all those in the earth hide themselves in the rocks. It ends up with the second coming again, which is what all these prophecies, so we can overlay these. There is no question about it. And uh, we can see at the end of chapter 6, the question is, who is able to stand when Yeshua returns? It says the 144,000 are the only ones able to stand. We've been talking about that as well. So let's move on a little bit, shall we, as we recap. Daniel 7, 2, and 3 tells us, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. This is the foundation upon which we're building, the line with the eagle's wings, and so on. So we see here that the eagle disappears from the world stage, and it says those great beasts, which are four or four kings, which arise out of the earth. It tells us that they arrive out of an area, it tells us in Revelation, of peoples, nations, languages, and tongues. So this is a very densely populated area with many different uh, languages, peoples, and so on. We can see clearly this is talking about 
uh, across the Atlantic from our position here in the West. Goes on to say, the fourth beast and the ten horns which are on its head. So now Daniel's zeroing in on the fourth beast. Why? Because the fourth beast was the one that had the persecuting power. Same thing that he did in Daniel 8. He focuses in on the fourth beast because this is the one the little horn comes from. Same thing as the horseman. More is said about the horseman and the persecution and the judgment that follows than the other beasts. More information. Same thing again. It's repeating and enlarging so that we need not err on the identity of these powers. Goes on to say, and the other horn which came up before whom three fell, namely that horn which the, had the eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words. So this is a power, this is a kingdom whose appearance was greater than his fellows. In other words, he had more influence, greater statue, more power, more influence, and, and so on. So he's a kingdom, and we've been, we've been demonstrating that this is talking about the papacy who comes out of the European Union. This is this notable horn that's on this fourth beast. Very interesting now, we see a transition. We get into the book of Revelation. We see a beast now, we're going to look at this. I just want to preface it here. We see the change coming in Revelation. In Revelation chapter 12, we see a dragon with seven heads, ten horns, and seven crowns. We don't want to miss that. We see this, this numbering system. This is the parallel to the fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. The Daniel chapter 4, uh, the chapter 7 beast, the fourth beast, it's said to have huge, um, it was dreadful and terrible, had huge teeth and it trampled the residue with his feet. It, it was just a disgusting animal and this little power came out of that power seven uh, were remaining at the end. Three were uprooted to make way for the papacy and seven were left over. We see that transition now as we go to Revelation chapter 7, which is or Revelation chapter 12, which is exactly the same beast. It is a revelation, a further revelation of the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7. This fourth beast with seven horns that were remaining. In here now we see this beast. It has seven heads. I see another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems or seven crowns. So this is telling us something very important. This beast has ten horns. These are the, this is the kingdom that it represented but it has seven heads, seven powers that are reigning, that have taken control of this. And the seven crowns depict that. Not all ten of those crowns are, or those horns are reigning. Only seven of them. That's why the seven crowns. And so we're going to see something very interesting. That is the fourth beast. That is Satan's number one tool. It's, it's almost looks like it's one in the same. He works through this beast the same way he worked through the serpent in the garden. The serpent wasn't Satan himself. Satan himself worked through this and he was called the serpent of old. This is exactly the same thing we see at the time of the end is the serpent, Satan himself, works through this dragon. This dragon is representative of earthly kingdoms and this would be the European Union. So this European Union is going to be first and foremost in persecuting God's people. We don't want to overlook this. Russia's not going to have to force the papacy to, uh, to do this. They are going to do this. The power that they lost at the time of the Reformation, when they gain that power, when they gain that supremacy, persecution will begin again. It will be not only a new world order, it will be a one world religion that follows. And the reason is, it's quite reasonable when you think about it. The reason is, is we've just gone through a war. We've just gone through a war that hopefully would end all wars. The papacy has come in, brought in world peace, pulled the world together, as it were, and now we have a new world order that's formed on the east side of the Atlantic Ocean. 
America at this time is broken, as we've seen. America, Canada is broken. The lion will have to go back to where it was because the eagle's wings now have been plucked off. So they will form a union, which we will see here shortly. This dragon, it says, the dragon was enraged with the woman, went to make war with the remnant or the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Yeshua. We've looked at the testimony of Yeshua. The same author, John, says in Revelation 19.10, says that the testimony of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. And I know I keep saying that, but we need to understand is that the spirit of prophecy is um, the ability to be able to tell what's coming in the future. And uh, this power, this dragon power, is not happy with people revealing what they're up to. And uh, that's one of the reasons why they are persecuted, because they're not only keeping the commandments, they actually have the spirit of prophecy, and they tell people what's coming. This is in, in sort of the same way that I'm doing it now. Um, I'm just reading the prophecies and uh, trying to help people understand what's contained in them. Uh, but this power is not going to be happy with people uh, like myself uh, that are trying to wake people up to show them what's going on. These powers will disappear as individuals. And John tells us these same powers in the seven-headed dragon, it says, And I saw a beast rising up out of the earth having seven heads. This is Daniel chapter, Revelation chapter 12 now. So we see the seven heads, the ten horns, on his crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name written. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and the feet were like the feet of a bear, and the mouth a mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his throne and great authority. We need to understand this. These are the kingdoms. This is the last effort. This is the ten toes of Daniel, as it were, the time of judgment where the rock came down and destroyed that kingdom. This is where we're marching to. This is exactly, we can see this on the world stage. We see the United States. We see the UK just pulled out of the EU. This is all in the making before our very eyes. We also see the European Union being formed. We see Russia flexing its muscles right now. We see China flexing its muscles right now. We also see the kings of Media and Persia are the ones that throw us into this time. We see them flexing its mu uh, their muscles right now. I, I just want to bring out, I, I did some homework on this, is Saudi Arabia. We've been talking about Saudi Arabia. They, I don't know if they had planned this in the timing, but right at the same time when this coronavirus came on the scene, they dumped oil on the market and drove the prices way down. Now, we've been hit in two different ways. We've been hit with the coronavirus. We've also been hit with extra low oil prices. What does that do? It cripples the economy, actually. You might be thinking, wow, I just paid $1.50 for a gallon of gas. That is not good. That is not good for our economy at all. And Saudi Arabia is responsible for making that happen. That cripples the oil companies, the shale companies, all those companies that are producing oil at a higher rate. I understand the oil went down to like $20 a barrel. Companies in the United States cannot survive on those kind of oil prices. So um, this is crippling that economy. The oil is, that, that part of our economy here in North America is huge, the ripple effect on that. We are suffering on two counts right now with the coronavirus and with what Saudi Arabia is doing. Very interesting. They will play a role. Keep your eyes on Saudi Arabia. Okay, so we see this beast coming up out of the sea where all these nations are. Uh, its body is like a leopard, feet like a bear. Uh, mouth like a lion, it has seven heads. These are those nations on the eastern continent there. Those are those nations that make up 
a new world order. And we've looked at that, that new world order, and we've seen that. And the harlot rides this beast. We saw this in Revelation 17 again. Then it said, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, it had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. And we can see the only other place in the world that this can be has to be North America. And fitting, we'll just look at it briefly here again, that this will be the one world order that we're looking for. Uh, and we've looked at this, the two symbols of these two nations, Buffalo, the United States of America. I heard someone on the news actually say that America will survive this and it will bring unity and it's a, a symbol of resilience. And I couldn't help but thinking, looking at this symbol in the seal of the United States, unity, resilience, and health. Wouldn't that be a picture for what we have to look forward to? Same thing with, the, uh, with Canada, uh, the bison being on the symbol for its country as well. Uh, two horns, no private interpretation here. Two horns represent a kingdom, two kingdoms. In this case, I believe Canada, the United States, a fitting symbol of the bison when they uh, join, as it were, together as a nation. The second beast performs signs so that it makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. He deceives those that dwell on the earth, and we talked about this. The earth is where this beast rises up out of. It doesn't need to deceive those on the other side of the Atlantic. They're already deceived. The papacy has those already deceived. But what America has to do, what Canada has to do, in order to play the game on the world stage again, they're going to have to submit and create a system that resembles or that bows down to, and that's what it says, they're granted in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast that was wounded by the sword. That's that first beast that's made up of the seven heads, the body of a leopard, feet of a bear, and the mouth of a lion. That's the one that was wounded, and they have to make an image to this beast. In other words, they have to create a system that's patterned after that, and that's this one world religion. Very interesting. We don't want to miss these points. It says that he was granted to give power to the breath, to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause many who would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. So this is a religious system that's created that has the authority to kill people that will not fall into line. We saw this in, in Babylon when the image was made. Those that didn't fall down and worship the image to the king of Babylon uh, had a death sentence. We saw all of this, and we saw what happened to those that didn't fall down. They were granted life by the life giver himself. Friends, we want to stay faithful and experience the miracles that our Father is going to play out on those that are faithful. Revelation 13, verse 16, he causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand, on their foreheads. We looked extensively at that, the mark of the beast. We're not going to take the time today to do that. Revelation 13, 17 tells us no one may buy, sell, except he has the mark of the name of the beast and the number of his name. Here again, emphasis, I don't want to miss this opportunity. If you're living downtown in a city at this time, you will starve to death if you do not accept the mark of the beast. This is the threat for those that do not accept the mark of the beast. This is why our Father has given us the warning so we can be out in the wilderness. It says the women flees into the wilderness for a time, times and a half, which is the time that this little horn power has control. No coincidence. No coincidence here. We want to start thinking. We do not have time to waste. Get in contact with people that are on this, uh, this wavelength, people of like mind. I know lots of people that are thinking seriously about this all over the states now. And um, if you're with a, a group that is starting to think this way, work together, folks. Work together. Uh, you can't do this by yourself. You just can't do it. I just want to say, may our Father and His Son bring rich blessings upon you. Abide in His Word and in His truth. Let's pray. 
Father in heaven, I thank you again for your word, for these prophecies that are just so loaded with truth. And as we move forward as a light that shines in a dark place, Father, we pray that you continually lighten our paths because this world is going to get rather dark. We're going to need this guide all the way through. We ask that you continue to work on our lives, continue to lead us and guide us into your ways and your righteousness. Father, we want to be on the right side of judgment. We want to have those books. We want to have our names remain written in those books and have our sins blotted out of the books. Father, we ask that you continue to work on us. We ask that you do this. We give you full permission to do this. Lead us and guide us in ways of righteousness. Teach us all things. Lead us and guide us into all truth. Father, we pray. And we thank you for that sacrifice that you have made that will give us ultimate right to that tree of life and that we can enter into that city. Amen. Amen.